How's it going? Whoa, that was really loud. Before I begin, thank you all for coming out, by the way, uh, on a Friday morning. Um, I really appreciate it, and it's awesome to see you all here. But before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land. And what I want to do really quickly is tell you why I acknowledge, right? Because we, we go to all sorts of events, and we hear people stand up and acknowledge, but it's kind of sometimes out of context, right? It's like this thing that we say, and it's a little bit sometimes, particularly for um, people that come from overseas, they're like, what is this acknowledgement that happens without context? And I was thinking about it the other day. And I thought every ancient civilization that we've ever heard of, the Aztecs, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, the civilization here in Australia is older than all of them. We travel thousands of miles around the world to check out these hectic sculptures, <laughs> these ruins. But how many of us have traveled to Uluru? How many of us have taken the time to learn about our own history, here in Collingwood even? The, the civilization here is older by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, up to 85 times older than every civilization out there. And we don't quite know how to deal with that. It's just a little bit awkward. We're like, oh, we don't know how to talk about the fact that we live on stolen land or that it's contested. And for me, as someone who was born in a country and came to Australia to escape its colonial history, I kind of also have to acknowledge that I'm part of a new one. And that's really, that's hard. So the reason I acknowledge is so that at least for a moment, every once in a while, I remember that I'm part of history, that I don't exist in some vacuum where who I am and my actions don't mean anything and don't make sense. And that hopefully to remind us all that we are part of that history and that we should do something about it. So. <laughs> With that, I ask you, how's it going? <laughs> Thank you all for the team for having me today. Um, I, as some of you may know, I'm moving slash have moved to London. And um, when I was looking at the dates that I wanted to leave, I thought, what is this creative mornings thing and should I stick around for it? And I'm really glad that I have. Um, so it's, it's an honor to be here. The topic of genius is really interesting, right? Um, firstly, because I never really considered it as something in my world. Um, so before I get right into that, what I'll do is give you a little bit of uh, just a brief story as to how I got here, how the, the term genius relates to me, and also what then I interpreted that as, and, and how I kind of see that in the context of things that I'm really passionate about, which is things like equality and equity. So for those, the way that I describe my heritage is that um, I pretend it's a pie, right? And if it was a pie, I would divide it into eight pieces, because I'm generous. Three pieces would be Sudanese, three pieces would be Egyptian, one would be Turkish and one would be Moroccan, right? So it is a delicious pie, right? We're talking best herbs and spices out, right? My family, I was born in Sudan. Um, my family moved to Brisbane when I was about a year and a half. We were the second Sudanese family in Brisbane, right? So people laugh. <laughs> like, and no, I always say to people, people weren't, they didn't hate us, they just literally had no idea where we came from. They were like, where is this Sudan? Like what? 
And there are all these great sort of migrant stories of my mum, like the neighbours inviting us over for, um, for dinner and asking us to bring a plate. And my parents were like, oh my God, they don't have enough crockery. <laughs> and so we'd rocked up with an entire dinner set and my dad brought a chair like just in case <laughs> and like confusion ensued, right? Um, just like great times. My mum tells another story about how like she had henna on her legs and she was in Woolies or something. Um, and some guy like bends down, picks up the edge of her skirt and starts lifting it up. And she's like, dude, what are you? He's like, where does it go? It's like, it only goes one way, mate. It's like curiosity, sexual harassment, Brisbane, right? <laughs> I love Queensland. Um, but the, <laughs> the Melbourne crowd never quite vibes with that. So, <laughs> so um, the, one of the interesting things though, when I'm thinking about this topic of genius, was the fact that when my parents, like the way that my parents kind of brought my little brother and I up, there was never a question around, all right, let me just get a quick show of hands. Who has heard of kind of the fixed versus growth mindset concept? Yep, mm, all right, cool, about a third. So just as a really quick explainer, <clears throat> there's this concept that, you know, while you're being, particularly while you're being brought up, that you can either sort of be shown the world through what is considered like a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. One is that you are X, Y, Z. You are good at maths or you are good at, you know, science or you are fast or you are, you know, have great aim. And these are things that you are, right? Whereas a growth mindset is the concept that those are things that you can become if you kind of work hard enough or study or whatever. And so this kind of goes back to what some would say like a Western versus Eastern or an individualistic versus collective philosophies. There's all sorts of different interpretations of that, which is to say, and also it's quite gendered, right? Often it can be, you know, as a girl you are this and as a boy you are this, as opposed to saying these are kind of things that you can become. And I was really lucky in that my parents never said that we were anything, right? They never sort of said, well, you are, you know, smart or you're not smart. It was always about you have the ability to work hard, right? And it was that classic migrant thing of if you, you know, bust your ass, you can get that grade. And so I'd always kind of gone through life thinking that if I worked hard enough, I'd be able to get it, that, to get whatever it is that I wanted to achieve. It wasn't necessarily about um, something that I was or I wasn't. But then there's the question of who decides what is amazing or not. And you may have heard of this guy, Joshua Bell. Have you guys heard of the... So Joshua Bell is this, like, hectic, amazing violinist, right? And there was a story that went around a few years ago where he, you know, sold out an entire theatre with $100 tickets, right, and played on this, like, multi-million dollar violin. And then a few days later, played the most difficult piece in the world in the subway, right, in New York, and only made, like, $32. And this question around, does, is it still genius even though nobody recognises it as that? And for you, know, you in the room, that's an interesting question. Is your work only valuable when other people see it as valuable? Is our Indigenous or First Nations history only valuable when somebody else from another country comes over and tells us it's valuable? Or does it have some sort of inherent value? Is it fixed? Or does it have a meaning that we, that can grow and can change depending on how we interpret it? But I mean, I guess looking at how that kind of relates to my story, I thought, well, where does this play in my world? And for me, genius, instead of being a thing that is fixed, if we look at it from a, a sort of the growth space, that relates to this concept of what I would call mindsets. Right, and so this is the part that I'm really interested in talking about. The brain is this crazy, amazing thing. We think we know a lot about the world, and then we realize we actually don't know that much about our own brains. Right, if you try to say to someone, um, what is pain? Like, how can you, like, it's a thing we all feel, but what is the tangible interpretation? Like, what, what how can you, you can maybe interpret it through art, but pain of, in of itself is not something that we can necessarily point to and exist in the world. 
So when we think about the power of our brains to control things, um, there's this amazing neuroscience that sort of talks about the fact that we can actually change, the way that we look at the world can actually change how the world operates for us, right? That is to say, if you think about something over and over and over and over again, your brain actually totally rewrites your pathways, your neural pathways, to match that, right? So if you think of something as a threat, right, and you think of it as a threat over and over and over and over, your brain rewrites your neural pathways to then see it as an actual threat. It's like, and the other thing that our brain does, which is like, related to the whole um, fact that we used to live in villages and would have to protect ourselves and all that kind of thing, is the fact that we're five times more likely to see a threat than we are to see something positive, which is why we remember that one bad comment rather than those 50 positive ones, right? Because those 50 positive ones aren't a danger to us. But that one negative one might be. It's a threat, and so you, your brain wants to hold on to that. And then you think about it more and more and more and it becomes entrenched in your mind. Now, how does this play out in other ways? Well, for me, it plays out in the space around gender. And I um, am someone who spent a lot of time in male-dominated industries. So, bit of background. I studied mechanical engineering. I um, was one of seven girls and 300 guys. And... Uh, Wanted to go into motorsport. The reality didn't quite match the expectation, so I came back to Australia and I thought, all right, I'm going to get a job um, in a field that I'm, you know, looks interesting. And I had two job options. One was to work in a nice engineering job in the city. I'd live at home with mum and dad. I'd be the, you know, good Sudanese Muslim girl. And the other was to go work on offshore oil and gas rigs uh, with a bunch of dudes my dad would never meet. Um, so, naturally, I chose that one. <laughs> I was also from Queensland, and I have a soft spot for bogans. So, I was like, yes, uh, neck tattoos. Um, I'm all about it. <laughs> Seriously. Um, anyway, my... my oh, all right, I'm not going to get sidetracked. Um, so, <laughs> I was the first girl they hired in my department in Australia. And I remember sitting across the table from my... <laughs> thank you. Sad. It was 2012. Um, <laughs> it's not actually the Queensland's problem this time either, it's just the industry. But anyway, I was sitting across the desk from my boss, my new boss, and he was like, Yasmin, is there any specialist equipment you need because you're a woman? I was like, mate, this is the question I've been waiting for all my life. I'm like, yes, I need trousers with more space for my booty. You have no idea how hard it is to find man's pants that fit me, okay? And I'm having, I'm like telling him, I'm like, listen, I have a Rio of an African woman, right? I get pancake ass all the time. And he's looking at me with the same look of confusion that I'm getting from half of you who don't understand the struggle, right? <laughs> he's like, excuse me? I'm like, look, it's fine. The struggle is real, but it's fine. Um, and I, you know, had man pants for the next two years. So, and then, then I headed out to work. And I remember um, driving with one, my first colleague, again, looking at me with like this real look of concern on his face. I'm like, oh man, what's going on? He was like, Yasmin, I've never worked with a woman before. I'm like, I know. <laughs> He's like, um, <clears throat> are you going to be able to lift the tools? <laughs> oh, mate, I said to him, you're a Filipino man half my size. I can bench you. <laughs> and Earl never offered to help me again. And I mean, it was, it was amazing, right? Because I would go into these situations and be the first chick in a lot of cases that they'd ever worked with. And I would hear them on the radio, they'd be like, she, can you see her? What does she look like? She's got a thing on her head. I'd be like, is she hot though? I'm like, I can, I can, I can hear you. They'd be like, she can hear us. <laughs> Does she have big tits? I'm like, I can still hear you. <laughs> right, men, like you'd think they grow up. Yeah. 
So <laughs> these are situations that I, like, and this is <laughs> also the first workplace that I'd ever worked in, right? So I just kind of assume that this is how all workplaces work. A um, <laughs> few awkward faces, you know. Um, but the amazing thing is, and this is when it comes to kind of the idea of mindsets, I didn't know that I didn't belong, right? Like, I didn't realize that I was actually different, right? For some reason, I kind of deeply believed that I was a middle-aged white dude, right? <laughs> I like, I just truly embodied it, right? So I'd like kind of walk with a bit of swagger, you know? I'd be like, oh, mate, fuck, lot. Like, yeah, did you watch our game on the week? Oh, mate. Like, I just talked like that for about four years, right? Because there was nobody else around me that was different. So I didn't see myself in the way that they all saw me. And I remember this, this, the moment that it, like, the penny dropped for me was um, I was in a town called Murumba, which is a, a lovely town in um, central Queensland, sitting in the airport, and a guy, a Chinese-Australian guy, walks up to the airport counter. And I looked at him, and I was like, oh, mate, he looks so out of place. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, shit, that's what I look like. Right? I had never seen what I looked like to others before. Right? It was the first time. And, and so people would often ask, like, Yasmin, you must feel like you must have felt like it was so challenging. Like, how did you? But the thing is, if, if I had gone in thinking, this is going to be challenging, I'm going to be so different, everyone's going to be looking at me, everyone's going to be treating me differently. If I went in with the mindset, that my gender or my race or my background was going to be something that was a disadvantage. I would have seen that disadvantage everywhere. It's selective bias, right? If we go looking for something, we'll find it. But instead, I went in seeing all the weirdness about me as something that was actually a positive, as something that actually gave me strength, as opposed to something that would make me not fit. Um, the <laughs> I talk about it, um, it was mentioned uh, in an interview I did recently, but it's true that being someone that looks a little bit different, particularly if I look more traditionally Muslim, if people are staring at me, I don't automatically assume that they're like hating. I just assume they think I'm hot, right? <laughs> I'm like, what's up? Beyonce's in the house. Like, Cause why not? I have no idea what's going on in their brain, so I'ma tell myself what I wanna tell myself, right? And so the amazing thing is, if we tell ourselves over and over and over again, something that's positive rather than something that's negative, we have the ability to rewire our brains to see that and to actually believe it and to actually go through the world and that changes our hormones, that changes our abilities, our capacity. They say that if you are told that you're bad at maths before you do a maths exam, you actually do worse, simply because you've been told... Like, it's not just kind of this idea of, oh, you'll feel better. It actually changes the way you operate. So if you're going through whatever work that you're going through or whatever life that you're going through, and you're telling yourself a story that's actually taking away your own power, you're doing yourself a disservice. But if you tell yourself a story, that, you know, maybe I am some sort of a genius and they haven't discovered it yet. Maybe I am really Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> and they just don't know. Because, you know, got a turban. They don't know. <laughs> There's amazing power in that. I've been, I've had an interesting few months, you may or may not have noticed. Um, and I remember having this, I had a coffee with a friend recently. You know there's one of those friends that tells you, you the truth that you need to hear but you're not ready to hear that truth yet? Mm. <laughs> this friend's like, Yasmin, this is just gonna be like the greatest learning experience you've ever had. And I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excuse my French. Um, but like, I didn't want to hear that, right? I genuinely was not in a space where I could hear that. But with a little enough distance, 
again, what has happened has happened, and I can't change what has happened. We cannot change, you know, in the case of gender, for example. It's not to say that the way that we think about things is going to change the structural inequality that exists. But in, that, in, in the absence of being able to change structural inequality overnight, what we can do is change the way that we engage with something. That's the only thing that we can control. The only thing that we can control. The only thing that I could control in this situation for the past few months is how I respond to it, or how I choose to relate to it. And so I guess in terms of you know, things for you to think about and things to leave you with, I would kind of just leave it in that. Realizing the power that we have to control our responses. Because the moment that we allow others control over our responses, we, we're giving away, we're, we're giving people a passport to controlling us. Right? We're giving people a passport to rewiring our brains for us. And I'm not about that. So don't underestimate the power of the stories that you tell yourself. Don't underestimate how how each of us as individuals have an incredible capacity not only to change ourselves, but to change the world around us. And even if by doing that, we have an impact on, of, on just one person. Whoa. <laughs> Computer's like, no, no. <laughs> Artificial intelligence, Yasmin. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> There's a whole scene. Anyway, that took away from my very dramatic moment. <laughs> I was like really vibing, I'm like, I got them. It's all happening. <laughs> but yeah, I'll just leave you with that. Don't underestimate the capacity that you have simply through the stories that you tell yourself to change the world around you. Because we're all in incredibly privileged positions and we owe it to ourselves to make the most of it. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. We've got some time for questions. We've got around like, you know, five, ten minutes for Q&A. So if anyone has something, just put your hands up. I'll call you out and we'll go from there. Who's anything for Yasmin? If you're from the Australian, I'm not taking any questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's only funny because it's true. <laughs> So for those who haven't heard, the question was, um, how do I essentially balance the stories that I tell myself versus the stories that are told about me? And honestly, this has been one of the most difficult things for me to kind of figure out about the last few months um, in particular, because I think for the last 10 years of my life, the stories about me publicly have been pretty aligned with the stories that I told myself, right? They, they were matched with kind of how I saw myself in the world. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and for reasons that I couldn't quite fathom, that, that changed dramatically. And I think for me to kind of um, grapple with that, what I had to do was realize that, I guess firstly I had to decide whose opinion mattered, right? Because if you know, the work that I was doing was important, um, or if I, yeah, if I felt like the work that I was doing was important, did every single person's opinion matter? Or was it the work that I was doing that was the most important? So what, how did I measure my success? Was I measuring my success by how many people liked me? Or what people's opinion in the street was? Or did I measure my success by actual tangible difference that I was being able to make? Or representation or whatever? So that was the first thing, whose opinion mattered? Um, and I guess feeding into that was becoming clear about what I wanted to achieve in the world. And then, so I'm gonna, there's, there's a phrase that my dad kept repeating this whole time. 
Um, it's an Arabic phrase. It says, Al-Jamal biyamshi wal kila bitambah, right? Which translates to, and it's a weird desert saying, um, the camel walks and the dogs keep barking, right? Which is to say, like the camel is the ship of the desert, right? It's cruising along, it's got a place to go to, right? And all the way, there are gonna be dogs barking. All the way on the sidelines, every village it goes through, wherever, there are dogs barking. The camel doesn't pay attention to the dogs. The camel's got a place to go, right? If the camel looked at every dog that barked at it and was like, what's up, dog? <laughs> It'd never get to where it's going. And so that could, you know, when I tell the story in English, it sounds kind of offensive, but like, <laughs> um, like, but the idea is kind of deciding really being clear about who are the voices that you're not interested in listening to and, and whether those voices actually have an impact on um, how important, like where I'm going. Now, if those dogs are telling me, yo, the, the destination has changed, you need to redirect, worth listening to. Um, but most of the time, they're just there to make noise. Thanks. Oh, what's the final line in? Nobody knows. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a... Uh, I think I just need a bit of time, to be honest, you know? Um, I'm someone who considered myself fairly resilient. Um, and it's been a fucking hectic few months. And so... Sorry, I shouldn't swear so much. <laughs> um, but I think I just need a little bit of space. And so I don't quite know what's going to happen. Um, I've got a few things on the boil, but I'm keeping them close to my chest and trying to be 26 for a little while. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting question. So um, the stuff, like, I struggle really hard when people are like, what do you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I cause trouble. Um, <laughs> so I started, I think my life up until about a year and a half ago was fairly straightforward. I started Youth Without Borders when I was 16, so I was in high school, quite young, and just did that alongside my engineering degree all the way through, right? Um, when I was at university, motorsport was my focus. Um, and then kind of I went to the UK, you know, offered work experience in Mercedes, like all, like it was all happening. And real, so two things, one, you need a lot of money to be in motorsport and I'm from Sudan. It's like not known for its cash. So, um, and, so I, and, and I needed to save to kind of do that and wasn't sure if it was actually what I wanted to do. So I came back to Australia and literally was just like, I need a job and being a Queenslander, the only jobs around are really in resources, right? So got that gig. Now, how that aligned alongside with kind of the radio, television, et cetera, um, I ended up writing an essay about my time on the rigs, right? It was just kind of like, oh, this is what it's like. And for me, it was just like my daily life. But everyone else was like, oh my God, what's this random Sudanese hijabi chick doing in, you know, on an oil rig with all these random neck tattooed men? Um, and so it was an interesting story for people. And I got approached by people to publish a book. I'd never, I'm an engineer, right? I'd never considered writing anything longer than, you know, a factual report before. But I suppose I'm also a storyteller. And so the idea of hopefully, like, of wanting to share a story was something that I was interested in. Now, I also worked for a big, uh, big bad corporate oil company. Um, and I told them that I was writing a book, but I don't think they, like, heard me or something. They, like, tuned out my voice. Um, because when the book was published, they were like, oh, no, you didn't. Um, <laughs> even though the book didn't mention the company name or anything like that. And so, despite the fact that um, I was a top-ranked drilling engineer in my region, despite the fact that I just, you know, killed it and gotten a double promotion to go supervise a rig offshore Brunei, they um, took away my promotion, they gave me a disciplinary warning, and they said, 
look, we're not really interested in, um, in supporting the kind of stuff that you do outside the company. Now, I'm going to take a quick moment here because this is also something that I've only recently processed as something that was quite gendered and something that was probably to do with my political views, right? Um, because there was an individual in the same company who had done similar things but had actually been, in similar age, ha actually been given promotions, right? So um, it's one of these things that you can never quite point to and say, you know, this is how discrimination works, but when you kind of step away from it, you're like, oh, damn, that doesn't seem fair or equal. So anyway, they were like, you're on this great track, we're gonna take away all your opportunities, um, you're gonna have to sit in, in the office for the next year. I was like, I'm not really interested in that. Um, so in the middle of last year, I decided to take a year off, do some book touring and see what happens. And in the midst of all of that, someone was like, hey, do you wanna do some television? I was like, oh yeah. Um, and that's literally what happened. Um, and uh, so I did a, a bit of broadcasting last year and kind of have really just followed the opportunities where they came up. Yeah, thanks. Oh, yes? Would you please consider going to politics? Would I please consider going to politics? Yeah, no, I'm a dual citizen. <laughs> It's, I mean, look, a lot of people have asked me this. It seems like such a dirty game. You know, like, I genuinely don't know how you can go into politics and hold on to your values. And that's terrible, right? Um, and it makes me sad that all the smartest, most, you know, moral, beautiful people I know want to stay as far away from politics as possible because it makes me wonder who are the people that are remaining that stay in it. Um, sad face. <laughs> but... But, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think it's definitely uh, something that we need to be engaged in now more than ever. Um, but I also think there are different modes of change and, and different people are probably suited to different things. Maybe one day down the line, but I don't think I have the stomach for it. Even, even this pa these past few months, the advice people were giving me is like, oh, you gotta play this game and you gotta talk to this person and you know, suck it up a little and just, and I'm like, I don't know. That, it does not sound genuine and authentic. It sounds like I'm playing some sort of a game and it might be a game for you, but for me it actually affects my life. You know, it actually affects the people that I care about. Like, you're trading away people's rights and so on for something that, you know, you look at it like it's a chessboard, but it's actually not. Um, and I, I haven't gotten my head around that yet. Thank you there. How are we for, for one, more. one more question. Yeah. Do I actively practice self-affirmations? Um, no, but it's an interesting question. I think I have, um, in particular moments in my life, I, like, I will find some sort of a quote or something, particularly from the Quran, that gives me strength. But it's not something that I sort of think about on a daily basis. I think it would be something, I try to make it, um, like a, just the way that I see the world as opposed to something that I have to tell myself, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out. I hope it was all right.